Well, greetings in Jesus' name. And thankful to have everyone here today. Everyone that's here. <laughs> and um, we pray for those who can't be here that God would minister to them. Yeah, I just, uh, I also just want to say amen to what was shared in the opening. Really, <clears throat> really appreciated it. Um, Norman, Norman talked about like listening and paying attention when others speak and, and tied it in with the, what we call the golden rule, like do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Christopher Morley said, there's only one rule to being a good talker. Learn to listen. I really like that. <clears throat> there's just some, there's just, just some fact to the, to when, when, so, when someone has that quality of being able to listen, once that person wants to talk, everybody wants to hear what he has to say. Just seems to be that way. <clears throat> And, and I appreciated what Norman pointed out there about we don't have to wait till these manners are shown to us. We ought not wait till these manners are shown to us so we can show them back. We, we are the ones who, who ought to be going out just, just like Jesus loved us while we were yet sinners. And he demonstrated these manners to the people who were killing him and sought his life. That's... That's how we go out into the world. <clears throat> let's, let's stand for a word of prayer. <clears throat> oh, Father in heaven, we thank you for all your love, for all your mercies and kindness to us. Thank you for salvation. Uh, help us to be faithful. Um, we thank you for this beautiful day and this beautiful time of the year uh, for green fields and sunshine and showers and growth and birth and life. We thank you for all these things. <clears throat> we pray, Lord, that within us we can be renewed day by day, uh, strengthened, uh, cleansed, uh, be, be made more into your image and, and uh, become, become true well-mannered, truth-speaking image-bearers of you. So help us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so today, I'd like to continue through the, in the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> When I, uh, when I began this series, I didn't have a very well thought out plan on how fast or slow to go through it, but I've just, I know we've kind of been crawling through it, but I've, I've been learning a lot as I've studied to, to share things, and I hope, I hope it's helpful, I hope it's blessing, it is to me. And I'm thankful to get to share these things with you. <clears throat> um, today, today we want to look at this next section on what Jesus said here in Matthew 5, starting in verse 33. <clears throat> he says again, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you make an oath by your head, <clears throat> for you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your statement be yes, yes, and no, no, Anything beyond these is of evil. <clears throat> I used to think that this is a rather insignificant teaching of Jesus, um, especially 
especially sandwiched in between here, um, the, the, the teachings before and after it. Um, he, got, he got done talking about anger, a new, a new standard for anger. He got talk, and then he talked about a new standard for purity. And I can totally relate to that. I can, I can understand why at the heart and the core of things that Jesus would address uh, uh, would, be, would be our battle against, against anger and against lust. I, I totally get it. And then, and then the teaching after this that we'll get to next is a teaching about uh, non-resistance against evil and, again, and about loving our enemies and doing good to the people that hate us. I get it. I get, I get why that's a big, big thing, a big concept to get and why it's central uh, to Jesus' teaching. But when's the last time you were tempted to swear an oath? When's the last time especially you thought, oh, I wish, wish I could swear an oath by Jerusalem or my head or heaven or earth? Probably not too often. <clears throat> But I've come to realize that there's a whole lot more meaning here than what I used to think, and that it's a vital teaching, that it has implications that are way broader and far more tangible than what most of us realize at a glance, and that without this teaching, there would really be something pretty big missing in Jesus' message. <clears throat> In fact, Jesus' brother James, when he wrote his epistle, said, Above all, swear no oath, neither by heaven nor... Think about this. We, I think we've all come to really appreciate the epistle of, of James. It's just, it's just packed with such uh, deep and profound truth. I mean, he talks about the relation of faith and works. He talks about lust and how wars began from that. He talks about the sin of partiality, the sin of the tongue. He has some extremely strong language against luxurious living and storing up wealth. And then in his last chapter, he says, but above all, swear not. Swear no oath. <clears throat> so today, let's try, to, let's try to unpack what Jesus and James are talking about and why this is such a big deal. <clears throat> I find that there are, maybe not limited to these two, but I find two major reasons why this is such, a, why this is such an important teaching. And I, I want to take a look at both of them. <clears throat> so, Way back in the beginning, in the garden, I hope, I hope you all don't get tired of me going way back to the beginning, what happened in the garden. I just, I just keep being more and more intrigued by the, by the depth of the truth in those first few chapters of the Bible <clears throat> and how much it is helpful in unraveling the mysteries of the gospel and the will of Christ. Uh, so, so in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, there was God who cannot lie. And there was man, Adam and Eve, who never sinned. So there had never been deceit, there had never been lie, a lie, there had never been dishonesty, there was, and therefore there was no mistrust, there was no suspicions. We can just hardly imagine a world like this. Can you imagine how straightforward and uncomplicated life would be if everyone from the children we're trying to train to the to the government we're subject to, would never lie. They would never misrepresent themselves. We could, we could trust that every word that comes out of their mouth is as reliable as if it came from God. How would that be? I feel like all of life's complications would be gone, nearly. <clears throat> oh, for such a world to live in, and oh, for such a kingdom to be a part of. Well, that's really how God intended it to be in the beginning. But Satan, 
whom the scripture calls the father of lies, spoiled all this. And he started by presenting himself as someone who he wasn't. <clears throat> he, he came and he, and, he, and he disguised himself and he showed up to Adam and Eve as a, as a splendid, charming, smooth-talking serpent so as to hide his identity. And, and with a few cleverly crafted questions and statements, he made himself sound like the good guy and God like the bad guy. Thus, he plunged humanity into a world of shame and dishonesty and mistrust and blame shifting and falsehoods and half truths and cheating and all kinds of all kinds of evil like that and so now we are left with trying to discern the legitimacy of nearly everything from the products we buy to the conversations we hear to the promises people make to the sermons that get preached we, we, we try to sift through all of this to figure out what's legitimate or not, what's true and what's false. <clears throat> so, because of lies, the consequence of lies is mistrust. And because of mistrust, it becomes needful to swear oaths. To make a solemn declaration by some sacred being or object that, that what we're saying this time is true. So people swear by something that's greater. Something that is more reliable, more sure than the word, th than their own word, in an, in an attempt to establish their word. So the first place in the Bible that we read that an oath was sworn was in Genesis chapter 21. I find this very interesting. If uh, uh, the, the, the previous chapter, we read how Abraham was sojourning, he, him and Sarah and his people were sojourning and they came to the land of Gerar. And so Abraham he didn't trust the people of Gerar. He, he did not trust that there was a fear of God there. And he had this wife, Sarah, who was a beautiful woman. And he was afraid that they're going to want her. Somebody there is going to want her to be their wife. To, and, and, and if they know that she's his wife, they're going to kill him so that they can take her. And so he told the people, she's my sister. Now, it was a half-truth. She was his half-sister, but that was totally irrelevant to the point. Uh, it, it, what, was, what was relevant here is that she was his wife, and primarily his wife, <clears throat> not primarily his half-sister. And, uh, and so, sure enough, Abimelech, the ruler of the region, saw this woman, wanted her, to be his wife, took her, brought her home. But before he did anything bad to her, God spoke to him in a dream and told him, this woman is this man's wife and you best return her or you're going to die. <clears throat> now what Abraham, what Abraham did here is he because he, didn't, because he didn't trust people, because he didn't trust these people, because he knows people are deceitful and lie, uh, he misrepresented himself in, in what his relation was to Sarah. And he said this half-truth. But what he said was irrelevant to the issue at hand, and it got others to believe him so that he could have his way. Well, what do you think? Do you think Abimelech can trust Abraham now? No. No. He can't trust Abraham. So now we go into the next chapter, in chapter 21, and there's been some time going by, some, sometime between this happening and what we're going to read here. Um, uh, Isaac was born, and, and I think, I don't know what, how many, I think there was several years of time here. And so here's what we read in chapter 21, in verse 22. 
It says, Now it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and his friend Akoazath and Pichol, the commander-in-chief of the army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all you do. Now therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my offspring or with my posterity, but that according to the righteousness I did to you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. So Abraham said, I swear. Abimelech had good reasons to not just believe Abraham's common word because he had, he had tricked him one time. And, and, and now he, this is the first time we read that this happened. Abimelech asks Abraham, swear to me that you won't deal with me deceitfully. And Abraham says, and he said, swear by God. And Abraham said, I swear. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and, and I think, I think, I think it was a fairly significant thing to Abraham to do this because it says he called the place Beersheba because it was the place where they made an oath. It, the, the word oath or swear in Hebrew is something like Sheba or Shaba or something like that. And so, so, so they named this place Beersheba or I think maybe the well of oath or something like that is what it means. Um, I get the impression... This was maybe something Abraham had never done before. <clears throat> so this is the first time, at least that we read, that an oath was sworn, and it was sworn by God, and it was requested uh, from a child of God by, by an outsider, you might say. Um, and, and Abraham swore by God. There was, there was no, you couldn't possibly swear by anything more reliable than God. To swear by God would be, it, it, when Abraham did that, it would be as if he was saying, if, if he says, I swear by God that I, will, uh, that I will do this thing, it would be as if he's saying, if my word that I'm speaking is false, then let God be false. I'm, making, I'm, I'm giving you my word on, on the basis of how true God is. <clears throat> This practice of swearing in order to bolster the claim that's being made got passed down through the generations. So Abraham made his servant swear when he sent him to fetch a, a, a wife for Isaac. He said, swear by God. I'm not sure if it says by God, but swear to me that you will not take one of the daughters of the Canaanites. <clears throat> and so his servant swore. Jacob, when he was making this deal with Esau about the birthright, Jacob said, swear to me your birthright. And Esau swore it to him. Um, we go on down the line, and, and Joseph is in Egypt, and Jacob comes down there to him. Israel is his name by this time. Um, and, and Israel makes Joseph swear that when he dies, he will bury, take him back up to the land of Canaan and bury him there. And so this goes on. Uh, such, such was the practice when people wanted to, wanted to be sure that a word could be trusted. So by the time we get to Mount Sinai with Moses and all of Israel, God has something to say about this. It's the third of the Ten Commandments. And he says, you shall not misuse my name. You shall not Take the name of the Lord your God in a vain way or misuse it. According to Josephus, the, the Israelites' primary, primary understanding of this was that we must not swear by God in a false way. That would be, that would be mis, dreadfully misusing his name. And we, and we also notice this throughout the rest of the Torah. We kind of hear this idea again and again. In Leviticus 19.12, it says, You shall not swear by my name falsely. And then he says, And so profane the name of God. 
In Deuteronomy 10, 20, he says, You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And listen to the rest of this. And by his name you shall swear. Like here, here in the Torah, we, they, I should say, are actually commanded to swear. You, you, sh- you shall swear by my name. In Deuteronomy 23, he says, if you, take a, if you make a vow, you shall not delay to fulfill it. And then a little later it says, but if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. In the Old Covenant, it's saying, swear oaths, even in God's name, but not falsely. That would be profaning God's name. And so... This is what happens with the Jews. In order to not break this third commandment and to not take the name of the Lord in vain, they start swearing by other things. They start swearing, um, they start avoiding using the name of God but still making these oaths. And instead of invoking God's name, they started invoking God's creation, and to swear by heaven, the sun, the earth, Jerusalem, the head. And, and, and in that way, you could kind of work the system or play the game in which I can still say this thing, that I swear by such and such thing, to, to, to make it seem to my hearer that my words are valid and authoritative and sure, while I've kept myself safe to not, to not break a law or, or not feel too guilty if I happen not to be able to keep this one. <clears throat> so Jesus sees through all this hypocrisy. He sees that this is not the answer to solving the problem. The problem is that your words are not reliable. But invoking God's name or his creation to validate your words just makes the problem worse. So, so when he's up here on the mountain, <clears throat> with his people, uh, and he's giving this message of all messages, this constitution of his new kingdom, he says, you have heard that the ancients were told You shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oaths at all. Either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, For you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond this is of evil. In so doing, Jesus laid the axe way down at the root of the problem. So swearing... This swearing oath was both the result and the cause of human dishonesty and untruthfulness. So it kind of works like this. I might have to erase this. Uh, it would be nice to leave it there, but I think I better use a bunch of room. <laughs> um, so the problem is... Um, that the common word is unreliable. Okay? Because people are liars. Uh, They have been they have been brought under the subjection of the father of lies, which is Satan. So the common word is unreliable. And what this produces 
is mistrust. And what does mistrust produce? It produces the need to swear an oath. And what happens if we validate oaths? It makes the, un makes the common word unreliable. And this cycle keeps going and going and going. And Jesus says, don't swear at all. Just let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. That's all that's needed to break this cycle. <clears throat> Immanuel Kant, who was a German philosopher, said the greater importance laid on oaths, the more we sanction the common lie. <clears throat> so, by the time Jesus came, the Jews had, had, had all kinds of, I was going to say creative, but I guess kind of creative, creative ways uh, of trying to navigate through all this and, and what, 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 what things are binding and what are not. When Jesus, when Jesus addressed the problem among the Pharisees, and I think Jesus was only touching the tip of an iceberg, but he said, you, you, you scribes and Pharisees, you, you say that if a man swears uh, by the temple, it's not binding, but if he swears by the gold in the temple, it's binding. If you swear by the altar, it's not binding, but if you swear by the offering on the altar, it's binding. You, you fools and blind men, can't you see that what's the difference? I mean, wh why, why is the gold sanctioned or binding, but not the temple that sanctifies the gold? Why is the offering binding, but not the uh, altar that makes the offering holy? Um, <clears throat> Uh, in, in, and I think it's similar to what he's saying. Don't don't swear by heaven, I, instead of thinking you, instead of not wanting to swear falsely and not wanting to swear by God, you want to swear by heaven. Well, that's my that's God's throne. Oh well, we'll do it by the earth then. Well, that's my footstool. Well then, by my head. Well, I created that too. Well, what are you what are you doing? <laughs> uh, now, <clears throat> sometimes. We tend to think that those religious people 2,000 years ago were just so foolish and we would never do such a thing. But are we sure? If, if the essence of swearing is about invoking something or someone to make your words seem more weighty and legitimate with the intention of trying to impress someone and to control their way of thinking so that you can end up having your way. If that's the essence of swearing, maybe we're not as free from it as we think we are. It's pretty common for us to be tempted to use God to make our plans and desires sound far more spiritual than they really are. What about terms like, I don't think it's God's will for me to go this time. More often than not, the truth is that we decided not to go on the basis of something that does not sound that spiritual. But somehow, we'd like to make us sound real spiritual to our hearer. What about these terms like, well, God just opened this door or he just closed this door. And I get it. I, I, I know God does that. But let's be careful and not, not just make our decisions and then, and then try to bring God's name in here for either our decision to do or to, do, to not do something and make it sound real spiritual to our hearers. I'm not saying it's wrong, it, it's wrong or not needful to recognize that God does those things. <clears throat> we might say things like, well, I just don't think this is God's calling for me. 
when often if we would just be straight up honest, we would just say no. I've often heard of people, and I'm not sure that I'm free of having done this, but having, having made moves or done something in my life that failed, and then said, yeah, God led me there to teach me something. That could altogether be true, but maybe the real honest answer would just be, you know, I decided to do this thing and it failed. And I learned a lesson. Instead of making a sound like we're really, really godly. <clears throat> Sometimes people even try to make their faults sound extra bad in order to leave the impression that they're a very humble person. These kind of things come from the same heart that would swear an oath to try to validate their words and it comes from evil. <clears throat> the truth will stand on its own. You don't need a good imagination or a good memory to express it. Proverbs 9.13 in the Septuagint says, He who supports himself with lies will shepherd winds and chase flying birds. Tim Mackey once said, a lie is maneuvering around what is really true about us so that we can manage people's perception of us. <clears throat> About a month ago or so, I was in Monet. Uh, and, and a man drove up... I I was in the lowest parking lot. A man drove up to me, and he was, um, I could tell he was a foreigner. He was slightly dark-skinned. Um, he, he had a strong accent. But he drove, uh, he didn't look in, in any way poor. Uh, he, I'm not good at identifying vehicles, but it was a newer kind of a vehicle. He was well-dressed. Uh, and he said, hey, I'm from Miami, Florida. Um, it was on a Friday or a Saturday. And, and it was kind of snowy, rainy, sleety type, type of weather. He said, I'm, I'm in Miami, from Miami, Florida. I'm wanting to get home. Uh, but but uh, the credit card company shut down my credit card. And uh, I, need, I need money for gas and food to get home. And... I, I actually, I, I, I took him to the gas station for just a little bit of time to think about it <laughs> um, and, and told him I'd at least fill up his car. But as I thought, thought about it, I thought, well, that's not, that, that's, that happens. That kind of thing happens. They, when, you're, when you're in a visiting area and the credit card company is afraid that uh, there's fraud going on, they'll shut things down. Uh, Okay, um, and, and so that could have perfectly made sense. Um, oh, the, the thing he told me, that I, I forgot this. He, he had this gold necklace on with a cross, right? And he said, I'll give you this gold necklace. You give me this money. As soon as I get back home, I'll send you your money plus extra money, and then you'll send my necklace back. I kind of roughly calculated how many miles is to Miami, Florida, how much gas it would take. I gave, him, I gave him plenty of money for enough gas and food to get back down there. And I told him, I don't want your necklace. Just, just send me the money back, because it was a significant amount. It was more, you know, not just a tank full of gas. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, he said, as soon as I get back home on Monday, I'll, I'll unfreeze my account and I'll, I'll get the money and send it to you. Well... In the back of my mind, though I believed his story, in the back of my mind I realized it's very possible that I'll never see this money. Um, but, I, but I did believe his story. Um, and I, and I kind of forgot about it. Maybe I thought about it a time or two that week, but then another week or so went by and I thought, oh yeah, remember that man? 
I gave them money. I haven't heard from him. I haven't gotten anything. And so I tried to call him. His, call, his number won't receive calls. I tried to text him. I get no response. And, and what hurts me is not the loss of that money. What, what's really, I mean, a little, maybe a little bit, not that much. But what really hurts me far more than that is just the fact that I was just so blatantly lied to. And I believed it. What good is a gold necklace with a cross? That means nothing. <clears throat> That's the world we live in. Such is the kingdom of this world. And Jesus is setting up a new kingdom. Uh, he, has a, he has a radical standard of truthfulness. He's reshaping our lives. He's reorganizing our values. He's recreating us as a new creation. And he wants to radically change how we would present ourselves and our requests to others. <clears throat> Ephesians, Ephesians 4, in verse 21, Paul says, If indeed you have heard him, and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts and deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. Therefore, laying aside all falsehood, Speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. <clears throat> the second part of this oaths that I think is important, maybe just as important, uh, but, but maybe, um, maybe not as relevant to our daily lives. Um, and and that, is, that is the part of swearing oaths that, that is about swearing an allegiance with someone or something. Some years ago, I was influenced about this by something that Leo Tolstoy wrote. And I know, I know Tolstoy's version of Christianity is wanting. I certainly cannot endorse... Uh, uh, everything he says, but as, as Leo Tolstoy was grappling with how, with how profoundly true the teachings of Jesus are, but how, how much what's called the church, the Orthodox Church there in Russia, doesn't, doesn't live them, and how, how to grapple with how someone can follow the teachings of Jesus and still uh, be... Uh, um, in allegiance with the state, I think he came to some really, really good and pretty sound understandings of some of these things that Jesus taught. <clears throat> here's, here's a little portion from his book, from one of his books, about what he believes. He said, on a certain day, at this time, I was walking in Moscow toward the... Bar Borovitsky Gate, where was stationed an old lame beggar with dirty clothes wrapped around his head. I took out my purse to bestow alms. But at the same moment, I saw a young soldier emerging from the Kremlin at a rapid pace, head well up, red of face, wearing the state insignia of military dignity. The beggar, on perceiving the soldier, arose in fear and ran with all his might toward the Alexander Garden. The soldier, after a vain attempt to come up with, a fu with the fugitive, stopped shouting, stopped, shouting forth an impen shouting forth an imprecation upon the poor wretch who had established himself under the gateway contrary to regulations. I waited for the soldier. When he approached me, I asked him if he knew how to read. Yes, why do you ask? Have you read the New Testament? Yes. And do you remember the words, 
If thine enemy hunger, feed him. And I repeated the passage, and he remembered it and heard me to the end. And I saw that he was uneasy, and two passers-by stopped and listened, and the soldier seemed to be troubled that he should be condemned for doing his duty by driving person away, a person away from a place where they had been forbidden to linger. He thought himself at fault and sought for an excuse. And suddenly his, lo- his eyes brightened, and he looked at me over his shoulder as if he were about to move away. And the military regulation, do you know anything about that? He demanded. No, I said. In that case, you have nothing to say to me, he retorted, with a triumphant wag of his head and an elevate, and elevating his plume once more, he marched away to his post. He was the only man that I ever met who had solved it with, in, with an inflexible logic the question which eternally confronted me in social relations and which, and which rises continually before every man who calls himself a Christian. So what, what Leo saw here was, was that here was a soldier who, 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 based on his oath and his allegiance to his country, did what he was supposed to do according to his country and drove away a beggar. And, and then when he's face to face with the thing that Jesus taught, if thine enemy hunger, feed him, he gets a little uneasy. And then he's like, wait a minute. Don't you know what the military regulations are? That's what I was faithful to. And here's what happens. Any time that we, we will swear an oath of allegiance to any individual or to any organization, the day will come when he or it will demand something of us that is contrary to Jesus. And we will be left condemned. Condemned both ways. Condemned if we don't do what Jesus says condemned if we uh, do what Jesus says and break an oath. And so Jesus says, swear not at all. Don't swear any allegiance to these things. <clears throat> when, when, when the devil tempted Jesus, he took him up on his high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, these have been given to me for me to give to whoever I want to. <clears throat> The devil is the father of lies, and all the kingdoms of the world have been founded upon deceit. They have conquered and subdued others to rise to their power and glory. And conquest is a brutal thing that is almost always, maybe always, covered with some kind of a deception. Francis Jennings, in his book, The Empire of the Fortune, wrote that falsehood is an absolute necessity because conquest is a dirty, nasty business that cannot be glorified in its nakedness. And he further says, deception of the multitude becomes necessary to sustain power, and deception of others rapidly progresses to deception of self. All conquest aristocracies have followed such paths. Jesus rejected this offer that Satan gave him. And instead, he established his own kingdom. It's built on truth and on honesty. And he never demands anything that is contrary to his will. His kingdom always has and always will clash with the other kingdoms of this world regardless how benevolent they might appear. If we swear our allegiance to it, to any of, any of these kingdoms of the world, any nations, countries of the world, we're, we're swearing our allegiance to Satan's realm and we'll, find, we'll fall into condemnation someday. Think about how, G, how James worded that in James when he said, above all, swear no oath either by heaven or by earth or, or any other oath, and then he ends it by saying this, lest you fall into condemnation. Don't swear an oath, oath unless you fall into condemnation. This is distinctive to Christianity. I don't think there's any other religions that forbid the swearing of oaths. 
and it strongly it strongly points to a to a kingdom concept of what Christianity is meant to be. Leo Tolstoy also wrote, we have organized a social order which we cherish and look upon as sacred. Jesus, whom we recognize as God, comes and tells us that our social organization is wrong. We recognize him as God, but we are not willing to renounce our social institutions. I went to public school for through through fifth from kindergarten through fifth grade before before we had a private school in our neighborhood and every morning the classroom would get up pledge allegiance uh, put put their hand over their heart and pledge allegiance to the uh, to the flag of the United States of America. <clears throat> I guess. I guess I attribute my, our parents allowing us to do that to their ignorance. Uh, but I wonder why, oh why were we even allowed to do that? And the interesting thing is there were, there, I think there were two students in my classroom who never stood up to pledge allegiance to the, to the flag. And they were Jehovah's Witness children. <laughs> Thinking back now, I'm like, yeah, they... They had, some, they had some sound concept of the kingdom. I, I mean, they have a lot of wrong concepts, don't get me wrong. But, but they do have a concept of Christianity being a kingdom in itself. <clears throat> so I want to address one thing. So is, is somebody doomed? I, I, said, I said that we will condemn ourselves whether we do or we don't if we, if we swear an oath. Um, is one doomed who has already made an oath? You know, people find themselves coming to the truth of Jesus and they've made a vow or an oath, whether it be to the government, some religious group, or to an illegitimate spouse. Is that vow binding? I'll give you my opinion. I... I I don't think so at all. Uh, we, we need to repent of those kind of vows and oaths that we had no business making. And here's, here's why I think so. If, if we go back to Numbers chapter 30, I'll read a few verses starting in verse 2. Then Moses spoke to the rulers of the tribes of Israel, saying, This is the word the Lord commanded. If any man should vow a vow to the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with an obligation, he may not defile his word. He shall do everything that proceeds out of his mouth. But if a woman should vow a vow to the Lord and bind herself with an obligation while, her, while in her father's house, house in her youth and her father should hear her vows and obligations with which she bound her soul and her father should pass over it in silence, then all her vows and every obligation with which she bound her soul shall stand and remain in force for her. But if on the day her father should hear and disapprove all her vows and obligations with which she bound her soul, then her vows shall not stand. Therefore, the Lord will consider her blameless because her father disapproved. But if she should actually be married and she binds her soul with vows made by an explicit statement of her own lips and her husband should hear and pass over it in silence the day he hears, then all her vows and obligations with which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband shall disapprove on the day of he hears, then all her vows and obligations with which she vows with which she bound her soul shall not remain in force because her husband disapproved of her. Therefore, the Lord will consider her blameless. And so I, I think there's a principle there of like, if, if a man vows a vow, it was binding, but if, if a man's daughter vowed a vow, if his father heard this, and stayed silent, it was binding. But if he disapproved it, the, the father's word 
trumped it, right? Same way with a husband and a wife. If a wife made a vow and her husband heard it, if he just remained silent, it was binding. But if he disapproved it and spoke it, then it was not binding. Our relationship to Christ is that of a, of a, of a wife to a husband, or that of a daughter to a father. And Jesus has not been silent on this subject. The day we spoke it, or even way before, he has disallowed, he has disapproved of these kind of oaths. <clears throat> and I, 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 wanna, I wanna give you, some of this is my opinion. I, 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 think, I think this is sound thinking, and, but, but like I, I don't think that that, that, that what I got done saying should be applied if we have somehow, if we make a promise or a vow that we will pay somebody a certain amount of money by a certain amount of time, that is not in violation to anything Jesus said. If we would make a vow that we will not eat until a certain time or not eat certain things for a certain while, that is not, that is not against the teachings of Jesus. If we make those kind of things, we should keep them. We should be a man of our word. But if we make these kind of vows, it's why I, it's why I believe that vows are not what makes a marriage. Is, is because uh, I, I think the definition of what makes a legitimate marriage is what God has joined together. What, what, what is a legitimate spouse for a legitimate, legitimate husband for a legitimate wife uh, joined together and God has joined them together. That's a legitimate marriage. But just a man who's been divorced, marrying someone who's been divorced, I don't care how many vows they make, Jesus has disapproved of this. That's not what makes a marriage. It's not legitimate. <clears throat> uh, I, I, think, I think because Jesus has spoken on these matters, we can, we can realize like this, this vow is not binding. We need to repent of what we did and, and start over. <clears throat> Swear not at all. A common way of swearing is to lay hands on a Bible, in, in our day, is to lay hands on a Bible and say, I swear to tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. What a contradiction. What an impossibility. I'd have way more confidence in somebody's simple answer, yes, or no. And I think Jesus' command to swear not, and his command that we'll get late, to later on that says judge not, go hand in hand. We, we must provide things honest in the sight of all men while we realize that we only see in part and darkly. None of us know the entire truth. The church, for several hundred years after Christ, held to a literal interpretation of Jesus' words. One of, the, one of the things that commonly happened at marketplaces was people would swear about the product they're trying to sell and sw swear about the, uh, whatever, the, 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 the quality or integrity of it. And uh, Clement of Alexandria had something to say about that. He said, whoever sells or buys anything should not name two prices for what he buys or sells, but stating the net price and studying to speak the truth, if he does not get the price, he gets the truth and is rich in the possessions of righteousness. But above all, let an oath on behalf of what is sold be far from you. Likewise, let oaths on account of any other thing be banished. He also writes later, or in another writing, where, where then is the necessity of an oath to him who lives in accordance with, extreme, with the extreme of truth? He then that does not even swear will be far from perjuring himself. And so he swears not even when asked for his oath, nor does he, even deny, nor does he ever deny so as to speak falsehood though he should die by tortures. And you can about guess when this changed for the church. After Constantine and the merging together of the state and the church, it became necessary again to swear oaths. 
And by the time of Augustine, Augustine, it was so necessary that he came up with a, with a rationalization of Jesus' words. Here it is. This is Augustine. Swearing is not to be considered among those things that are good. Nevertheless, it should be considered among those things that are necessary. Therefore, when a Christian understands that distinction, he should refrain as far as he can from engaging in swearing, unless it is by necessity. By necessity, I mean when a Christian sees that men are slow to believe what is useful for them to believe unless they are assured by an oath. Pretty clever rationalization. But sadly, what has nearly been considered mainstream Christianity since then has held to things like this. Luther had reasoned that in private dealings, don't swear oaths. In public dealings, swear oaths. <clears throat> Even in our day, John MacArthur, uh, one of the most popular preachers of our day, says, make no oaths at all means Oaths are to be used only on important occasions. It has been the little flocks throughout history who've stopped, who stepped out from the state churches, who have, who have been gripped by the simple and straightforward truths that Jesus gave here on the mountain, who've, uh, who've, uh, believe that he is the one and that he has the words of life that, that have rejected such rationalizations. Conrad Grebel, an early Anabaptist, said, I believe the word of God without a complicated interpretation, and from that belief I speak. Such people and groups as these little flocks, these cast-outs, these re rejects, Anabaptists, Waldensians, Moravians, uh, uh, all these people, they were, they were known even by their enemies as being, in spite, of, in spite of them hating them, they were known by a lot of their enemies as being honest and trustworthy. One of the enemies of the Waldensians said, if you question the heretic about his faith, the heretic being a Waldensian, if you question the heretic about his faith, nothing is more Christian than what he says. If about his dealing, if about his daily converse, nothing is more blameless. And what he says, he proves by his activities. As regards to his life and conduct, he cheats no one. He pushes ahead of no one. He does violence to no one. Moreover, his cheeks are pale with fasting. He does not eat the bread of idleness. He labors with his hands and thus makes his living. Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6 say, Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. <clears throat> In closing... I'd just like to tell you a little bit yet about, uh, about Polycarp and his martyrdom. So when they brought him in, he was an old man, an old man. And when they brought him in uh, to the, to the uh, theater there, or, or not the theater, but the, uh, oh, what do they call it? Colosseum. When they brought him into the Colosseum there, there was, the people saw him, many of them recognized who he was, and there was a big, big tumult. And they asked him if he's the Polycarp, and he said he is. And so the proconsul tried to persuade him, and he said thing, they said things like, Have respect of your old age. Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Say away with the atheists. The Romans called the Christians atheists because they refused to believe in all their gods. And Polycarp waves his hands out at the people and says, away with the atheists. And they weren't satisfied with that. And they said, swear, and I will set you at liberty. Reproach Christ. And Polycarp said, 86 years have I served him. 
and he never did me any injury, how then can I blaspheme my king and savior? <clears throat> May the Lord add his blessing. I'll open it up for people to share comments or corrections. Hey, Brother Duane, uh, thank you so much. Uh, definitely some, some really good uh, depth there that I hadn't really thought about before. I really appreciate even back in Genesis and just seeing that relationship with, uh, even though Abraham spoke the truth, it's like, okay, this is my sister. Okay, she is, but obviously the emphasis is uh, the issue at hand, relevant thing was whether he was his wife or not. And then, of course, in the next chapter, we see a reason for Abimelech to mistrust. And uh, and this cycle here that goes all the way back into the garden of the common word being unreliable, leading to mistrust. Now, one thing that I wanted to point out, and actually I'm surprised you didn't use the word, was faith. And if any, some of you have heard me say before, these these... These words that probably, probably, you know, 1611 when the King James was written, you know, it was a common way for people to speak and use such words and had great meaning and stuff. But uh, for people to realize the word faith means trust, it means belief and those two ideas. And uh, it would make sense then from, from this well-painted picture that Brother Duane did of why faith is so critical, critical to God. The lack of mistrust, or the opposite of faith, the unfaithfulness, the lack of believability um, necessitates that that be remedied and restored. So, yeah, really, uh, really good stuff. Um, I guess one, uh, uh, I guess what you were showing, Brother Dwayne, when you were saying towards the end there of your message, you were talking about certain types of swearing that we should do. I think what you were illustrating there is not that we should be swearing, is that since this commandment that goes all the way back to the law of Moses and Numbers about the husband who is Christ over us, disapproving, then, you know, just illustrating that when we say we're going to do something, we should do it. And, and, and one, and I think you said it, one thing I'd never really thought about before, because it reads the same way in Greek as it does in English, that it repeats the word for yes with Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and repeats the word for no. And I think the second no, and of course, whether it's Greek or whether it's English, either way, it's going to be interpretation. I think the second yes and the second no is saying let your yes mean that you're going to go do it and your no means that you're not going to do it. And um, I think, yeah, we should be real careful that if we tell anyone, not just a brother, that we're going to do something, that we do it, we don't come back later and say, oh, I've changed my mind or... A, you know, someone say, no, I'm not going to do that. And they come back later and change our mind. And, and I would really like to hear what the brethren think about that because is there a time where it's okay? I mean, do we, do we have to get the permission of the person that we said we would do it? We would do this or we wouldn't do this? Do we, if we get the permission that, yeah, it's okay for me to recant on that, is that required? Um, I would think that it would be. Um, and that would be if it would be allowed under God at all to, once you said you're going to do it, do it. As um, James seems to say, I think a reasonable translation is, um, else be condemned when he's speaking about the words of Christ on this issue. Um, or judged. I mean, it could be understood as being judged um, or condemned. I'm not sure which. But, um, but yeah, I would like to hear what maybe your brothers think about that. If somebody says they're going to do something, hey, brother, I'm going to do this for you, or hey, brother, I'm not going to do that for you, and then they change their mind, is that under Christ? Is that permissible? And, and obviously, considering also as James is expounding or giving commentary about what Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount, um, and if it is okay, do you have to get the other brother, or the even if it's not a brother? I mean, I would like to hear opinions on that as well. Um, that we have to get the other person to agree to say, hey, can you let me off the hook on this? Because I said I was going to do it. And if they don't, then you stick to it. Or I would just like to hear what people think about that. So, just. Leroy. I was just going to say good communication. That's one, another reason why when you 
when you say you'll do something, just remember, I don't know what tomorrow holds, as the Lord wills. And then things can come up. I mean, there's, things, there's reasons sometimes we can't physically do what we had said we would do. I mean, that's that's different than just being negligent. In my opinion. Wants communication, but we we don't need this to be a big discussion. Amen, brother Dwayne. So many profound points, and I appreciate the ending with Polycarp brought tears to my eyes. That 86 years old, and he says, "I'm not gonna, not gonna, uh, <coughs> uh, what's the word? Surrender or, or give in to uh, to the uh, <coughs> uh, world." And Brother Brett just mentioned that basically everyone knows that James, they say that James is a commentary in the Sermon on the Mount. His Brother Brett just mentioned that. This question for you though, Dwayne, when the man who stopped you in Lowe's parking lot, did he perhaps stop you because you had verses on your vehicle? Nice. All right. <laughs> well, bless you. I mean, that's, that's kind of a given. I know Brother Walter tells the story. He was in a, a big uh, oh, parking lot or something and and uh, there was lots of fancy cars, you know, Lexuses and whatever, the cars. And, and this man needed a jump. And so he comes to Brother Walter, who was riding a, maybe the blue pickup or something, and he asked him for a jump. But why didn't he get all the rich, you know, the rich people there to ask for a jump? But he picked on Walter, and so he picks on you because you had Bible verses. And, hey, you may get that check in the mail. Uh, I know, uh, but don't, don't hold your breath. <laughs> I know. And, uh, <laughs> and on Tolstoy, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, I thought that was a, a white lie that he said, do you know the military regulations? Well, he was a career soldier. He was a career military man. That was kind of stressing. This was after he left that, right, when Tolstoy with the beggar at the gate. Do you know the regulations? And uh, he, he, Tolstoy said, no, come on. Tolstoy was a captain or he was... War and Peace, he, he was, an, he was, a, he was a, a soldier for most of his life. And that, maybe he didn't know the exact regulation, but he was foxy. I think he was foxy. A lot to be magnified. Hey, Brother Dwayne, one thought I had too was, like you said in the opening, um, you said, when's the last time you, you kind of lusted after, desired after uh, swearing. swearing? And, it, and that's true, it's like, no, no. Well, what you do desire is for the flip side, for I am really desirous to be able to trust this individual or to be able to believe this individual. Yeah, I guess where you come. And I'm kind of wishing he would, he would maybe do the oath or something. I guess, I guess you might. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, another thought I had too was is, uh, I, a lot of, oh, there's so much there. It's so good. Um, where you were saying how they probably came up with this. First, it was all about heaven, then it came down to earth, and swearing on these different things. And I can see where they probably, because Jesus tells us these, these, these rulers over Jerusalem, over, over, over the people, were very uh, greedy. And so probably the reason why they made it about the, the gold and the silver on it is so the people would bring gold and silver to them. Because who's going to get that? They're going to get it. And yeah, so I've been thinking already to maybe respond a little bit to Brett's question there, and it ties in with your question, Micah, can a Christian make a vow? So, and, and thank you, Brett, for like clarifying that if, if it wasn't clear. Like, I, I don't... I realize what I said could have made it sound like maybe certain kinds of vows or certain kinds of, um, you know, commitments or swearing was, was what you used. I did not mean to say that you should swear that you'll pay a certain amount of money to somebody or, or you know, whatever you whatever kind of commitment you make, not, not eat something or... Um, so, so I don't think you should swear an oath about those things. Um, I think we should be extremely careful in making any kind of a vow whatsoever. It's a little hard for me to 
It's a little hard for me to be dogmatic about saying that a Christian cannot or should not ever make a vow because I kind of think Paul did. And, no? Bad translation? Okay. But you can tell by the context when Jesus saying, wish like this, it, it means prayer. Okay. So, yeah. That, that, that's helpful. Like, my, my understanding of Jesus would be like, I guess no. Um, and yet, I guess I'd want to just be kind of careful about, about how dogmatic I want to should get about that. Um, yeah. Okay, so so may, maybe to expound even further, like most of us probably made marriage vows that are married. And I don't think it's wrong to make some kind of a vow in marriage. Um, but I don't think any amount of vows or not vows changes any obligation in the marriage, the, 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 um, uh, the duty of the husband, the duty of the wife, the uh, permanency of the marriage, I don't think is changed by, by any amount or no amount of, of vows. Uh, I think I think the duties are are written out in Scripture and and our 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 places and and if we're if God has joined us together, we we need to be faithful there. I don't know. I'd just share my thoughts if anybody cares to hear. Um, I think the the picture that you painted before we got into using words swearing and and vows illustrates God's intention. I think the choice of translating these words as vow has contributed to the idea of uncertainty that you have. I think this picture you painted makes it very clear the answer to his question. I also think that when two people are standing up here committing their lives to each other, that somebody coming along, which they have somewhere way back, and we use it in our culture, that they're making marriage vows. They're not making marriage vows. They're doing what Jesus said, let your yes be yes and no be no. I will be with you until the end, till death do us part. And then somebody come along called a vow, gives the appearance as if there's a distinction, as if sometimes they don't really do what they say they're going to do, but now here they're, they're definitely, it's reliable. You can really trust what they just said. I don't, I, I don't think the true Christian, and I believe we are, is making the distinction. They just right now are actually saying, I'm going to be with you to the end like Daniel and Mabel just did. And then somebody comes along and gives it a vow, seems to paint a picture of a contrast and distinction. But no, they're, they're, I'm sure Mabel's the same as Daniel. They're always doing what they say they're going to do. And they're doing exactly what Jesus said. So if somebody wants to call it a vow and say, hey, listen, I'm, this is what I'm saying I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it. If somebody wants to call it a vow, well, okay, go ahead. I'm not going to nitpick your words, but... I just, this is the way I do life. I always do what I say I'm going to do, and I always don't do what I say I'm not going to do, because that's what Jesus told me to do, and he's my Lord. He's, he's the husband over the church, over the wife that I'm a part of. And, and whether someone wants to call that a vow or not, it's semantics. Uh, so that's kind of my thoughts. Makes sense to me. Hey. You want I appreciate Brother Brett's thing on, on be angry and sin not. I mean, I, I really think that's the way he told us that if you get angry or don't be angry and sin not, I think that from a Greek scholar that really helped. Help. No? I'm missing it? Scholar. Huh? Oh, scholar. scholar. But anyway, um, no, the other side brings up, and we tried it last week, and, and uh, I don't know if it helped it or not, but the other side of truth, of course, is lie. Is it ever permissible? to tell a lie. And Rahab was brought up, Corey Ten Boom, you know, the same, and it's going, but I've been listening to that for years over, you know, ever permissible. Like MacArthur says, only an oath for important things. Okay, Johnny, 
No, Johnny boy, I know. No, okay, John, what are the important things and what are the inferior things you make in, in you know, I, I pray for the Calvinist MacArthur. I've learned some from him, but I also learned not to be a Calvinist. And, uh, but anyway, uh, I just think it's never permissible to tell a lie. It's just not right. But, I mean, I know others would say, well, Rahab protected the spies. And I, I could be corrected in that, but I don't think we should ever... We did it last week, right? We hashed it around, and we, I got to this, we got to the same point. Half of us said, remember, Will? Remember doing that? We get to the same. <laughs> is it okay or isn't it? And, you know, you get strong verses. All liars will inherit the lake of fire. And then, uh, well, yeah, but she saved, she saved uh, the spies, Joshua and Caleb. Uh, the, two, the spies, they weren't Joshua and Caleb. But she, I, anyway, that's then the flip side. The Lord be magnified. I can't. answer to that brother is just pray that we don't fall into temptation um, there's nobody here needing to lie to save anybody's life um, people today lie for they lie for reputation and gain um, I don't know anybody lying to save anybody's life so that's the day we live in and, and the, that's what the, the message spoke to me is so, and we deal with it every day in our business relationships. We deal with we deal with it with uh, unreliable help, um, and and uh, they won't hesitate. Yeah, I swear that this is what's going on. It means nothing. It means nothing. Is just uh, back to the word. Uh, <clears throat> If you if you agree to do something, give it give it your best, and even that, things can happen. Um, we're we're employed in a business that a lot of things can happen that uh, prevent our intentions from being fulfilled, and that gives opportunity to go back and and uh, and make things right and and persist and and show people that you really do intend to carry through, and it goes a long ways. It goes a long a long way, uh, a lot further than more words. So. I don't know if that makes any sense. Lying to save someone's life isn't our daily temptation. And I can't answer that question, but it's faced with that. I don't know what my answer is. For my own life, I don't think I would. For somebody else's, it would no temptation is too great. God will give you a way to escape, right? Whether it's silence or, or more silence. I want to claim that promise for sure. Yeah, I'll just uh, share my opinion on uh, that. the oaths, since you kind of shared a little bit of your opinion, Dwayne. Uh, the, if, if, we, if we think that Jesus, you know, our father, our husband, God has disallowed all oaths. Um, and that when we come to him and we realize that we're not to, to make oaths, we should, we should repent of them and repent of all of them, not just the ones that are, uh, that actually are, like, that we couldn't carry out without violating, like, a specific other command of Jesus because I mean is not I mean if if the swearing of oaths is is to be repented of shouldn't we repent of all of them even if it's something say about eating you know if we make make an oath about not eating meat use that for an example um, whether 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 we eat meat or not should not be because of an oath we 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 made or not it's fine not to eat meat it just we just shouldn't be bound because of an oath we should repent of the oath i think it's my opinion yeah, this is this is really good um yeah i think regardless of what we call it i think we can deceive ourselves if we as long as we don't use these words oath or swear or vow or something that our behavior is what matters it's not what we call it whether it's English or 
German or Pennsylvania Dutch or it doesn't matter what it's called. It's like when there's a distinction where now in my mind, because of whatever words I said, I know I'm going to really hold to this and make sure I accomplish what I said I'm going to do. But then other times I don't give it the same umph, the same striving. We are living a life of swearing and taking oaths, are we not? There should never be a distinction. We should be making the same effort and striving to do what we say we're going to do and not do what we say we're not going to do at all times. There should never be a distinction. So that's how I see it. Regardless of what we decide to call it, it doesn't matter. God is not, stop, God is not or Jesus is not standing on the server on the mountain. Don't use these words. <laughs> he doesn't care about words. He cares about what we do, what's in our hearts, how we treat people. So. Oh.